good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the next um, TS4 webinar. And um, this webinar is sponsored by the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies and the New York Southeast Asia Network. I am very pleased today to welcome um, Dr. Napon Jatusripitak to our webinar, and he's going to be talking today about patronage politics in Thailand. So Napon um, is currently a visiting fellow in the Thailand Studies Programme at um, ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. He holds a PhD and MA in political science from Northwestern University, MA in sociocultural anthropology from Columbia University, and BA in economics and Asian studies from Cornell. So welcome to the TS4 seminar, Napon. It's great to have you here, and I'm very excited to listen to you your presentation. Thank you, Petra, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, and the New York Southeast Asia Network for having me today. In this presentation, I'll be discussing the role of patronage politics in Thailand. By patronage politics, I am referring to the ways in which political parties, politicians offer money, goods, services, jobs, favors, and other benefits to individuals or groups in society in order to gain their support particularly during elections. Of Great. course, this so, practice is not so, um, not yeah, unique. But, yeah. Uh, sorry, just to interrupt yeah. you, I'll just uh, jump okay. in and just give um, a few because we've got people still joining. So oh, okay. I've got... Yeah. I've got a few things to say. So, okay, great. audience. So, those who are joining us now, I would like to let you know that you're free to post questions throughout the, you know, the, the duration of the presentation. Um, please use the Q and A chat um, function. Sorry, please use the Q and A, not the chat function. So you'll see it at the bottom of your screen. It's the Q and A function once again, not the chat. Um, you can post the questions during the talk, but we will have a dedicated Q&A session after Napon finishes talking, and um, he will then be answering your questions. Oftentimes, there might be a few more questions than what we can manage, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible in the given time. So now over to you, Napon, and um, we're all very much looking forward to your presentation. Okay, great. Um... Let me start again. Uh, by patronage politics, I'm referring to the ways in which political parties and politicians distribute money, goods, services, jobs, favors, and other benefits to individuals or groups in society as a way to gain their support, particularly during elections. Of course, this practice is by no means unique to Thailand. It's synonymous with democracy in many developing countries, especially where race or ideology is not the main currency of electoral competition. But in my view, I think patronage politics has not only played a central role in shaping political outcomes in Thailand, its surprising durability despite significant changes in the political landscape in the past two decades contains valuable lessons that cannot be easily found elsewhere. So in Thailand's 2019 general elections, we saw the resurgence of patronage politics in a landscape marked by an extreme concentration of power in the military regime. Policy issues and ideological debates took much of the spotlight, but old-style patronage politics also returned with a vengeance. For instance, uh, at a political rally held in the Northeast just three days before the elections, I witnessed party leaders making grand speeches about welfare policies, while many attendees received 500 baht for showing up and 50 baht for food and beverage, paid out by local leaders who also provided transportation to and from the rally. So my presentation today will provide a very general overview of how these practices underpin and still underpin electoral competition in Thailand and how they have evolved in recent years. I will argue that the presence of a military regime seeking to maintain power through elections has contributed to the political survival and success of provincial elites, dynasties, and factions who empower themselves using patronage politics. And before we get into the explanation, I wanna make sure that we are on the same page in terms of what we mean, um, what this looks like in Thailand, um, since this may or may not be self-evident, so at the risk of sounding too abstract or over oversimplifying what's obviously a very complex phenomenon, I want to start by introducing the concept and provide a brief sketch of the context. And throughout my presentation, I'll be drawing on data collected through field work and interviews with politicians, both canvassers and other actors in 2019 and 2020. Uh, primarily in the north and northeastern provinces. And due to time constraints, I will not be discussing the methodology at this time, but I'm happy to do so after the presentation. So what is patronage politics? 
in many countries around the world that hold elections, political parties and politicians often compete for the people's votes by offering a broad range of goods and services to voters in the hope of gaining their support in return. For example, a candidate might offer money, food, medicine to supporters during elections, or a party in government might improve public housing for favorite constituencies. Political scientists have studied this phenomenon using many different conceptual frameworks and lenses. I'm using the term patronage politics with an emphasis on three conceptual attributes. First, patronage politics is selective, meaning that there's some level of targeting involved when parties or politicians distribute benefits to the electorate. And that might occur at the level of individuals in the case of vote buying, or at the level of communities in the case of club goods, like building a bridge or a road that's only accessible by local residents. Second, patronage politics is secondary, uh, discretionary, sorry, uh, meaning that the benefits are delivered as special favor by the politician rather than as a fulfillment of their official duty. So if you were given a benefit, it was given to you not according to some codified criteria, like belonging to a certain category or an income bracket, but because someone exercised his or her personal influence to grant you this benefit. And lastly, patronage politics is sometimes contingent, giving rise to what political scientists call clientelism. In these cases, politicians put in concrete efforts to monitor and enforce the compliance of their recipients, for example, by delivering the benefits in multiple rounds and withdrawing these benefits to individuals or communities that do not end up supporting them in return. Or more directly, and quite, I think it's quite rare um, in some parts of the world nowadays, politicians might hire brokers to simply escort you to the polling station and place them where they can see how you vote, whether you turn out, look at you in the eye, for example. Um, so how is this organized in Thailand? There's actually quite an extensive literature that touches on this topic directly or indirectly going back more than two decades. And despite important differences in the theoretical, the theoretical framing, there's actually a great deal of commonality and continuity in terms of what's already been said about the organizations that are associated with patronage politics or related practices such as vote buying. The general understanding is that Thai election campaigns, especially in rural Thailand since around the 1980s, have frequently been outsourced to informal networks of electoral middlemen known as vote canvassers or huokhanan. These networks usually consist of local government officials, local politicians, community leaders, and other influential figures who hold sway over voters in their localities usually through a mix of material inducements, intimidation, personal reputation, or local contribution. These networks may be put together in an ad hoc manner shortly before the elections, or they may be derived from local patronage systems that are maintained all year round by provincial elites, political dynasties, or local factions. And since these networks usually map closely to the administrative boundaries and are sustained through the downward flow of resources, they're often multi-layered and hierarchical in character, meaning that they reach outward and downward from the leader of the network, who might be an MP or some other influential figure, down to local leaders situated at the level of district, sub-district, and so on. It's an open secret that during elections, political parties and candidates would compete for the allegiance of people who control these networks and get them to mobilize their networks on their behalf, offering money, protection, concession, government positions or cabinet seats in return. Where a lot of scholars tend to diverge was in how they problematized this arrangement. Some saw it as a pathway through which provincial businessmen converted their wealth into power and power into wealth, contributing to systemic vote buying, corruption, factionalism, weak parties, and parliamentary instability. While others highlight the Bangkok elite's tendency to blame these symptoms on rural politicians and voters as the real problem, as this perpetuated unfounded assumptions about differences in rationality between the urban and rural electorate. These assumptions became part of the rhetoric in favor of reforming the political system in a conservative direction and against majoritarian, majoritarian governments, including uh, the Thai Rak Thai, whose populist policies were framed by some critics as a continuation of vote buying and patronage by other means. So in my own research, I did not observe a significant departure in terms of the form that vote canvassing networks assume, but I did come away with the understanding that there's a great deal of diversity and variation in terms of how each network operates, who vote canvassers are, and how they mobilize support from ordinary voters, including more generally how vote canvassing networks fit into the broader political system. 
for example, in relation to political parties and the state bureaucracy, these dimensions, in my opinion, are not fixed or static, even when both canvassing networks as a pattern of campaigning continues to be salient across time and space. In the next few slides, I'm going to feature some of the examples from my fieldwork and interviews. These, are, these examples are by no means representative or indicative of an insider's point of view, but I hope that they can still offer some insight into the role that patronage politics and vote canvassing networks play in Thailand in 2019. So this is an excerpt from an interview with a party executive who played a role in selecting candidates for, for a political party in the 2019 general elections. We must accept that the Bobobotam patronage system is the foundation of Thai politics, a deep-rooted one, not just Thai politics, but Thai society in general. It's a complex web of overlapping exchange relationships in which people help one another and in which there's no real distinction between political affairs and everyday affairs. Politicians simply take advantage of this underlying structure or system on a regular basis. This makes them the primary movers and stakeholders of the system. In order to compete with other like-minded politicians, they recruit bureaucrats like district chiefs, governors, agricultural or health agency officials to form their own networks. The same goes for local politicians, community leaders, and heads of local associations. They then use these networks to take care of their families, friends, followers, and supporters. Of course, from the standpoint of political parties, we must select winners. And one of the dominant characteristics of these winners is their procession of Rebobobatam. It's the central foundations of the votes. Based on this alone, one can almost predict whether the probability of winning an election for a given candidate is high or low. I witnessed a similar perspective at the level of individual MPs. In an interview with an MP from a province in central Thailand, I asked a question about how vote canvassing networks may have been affected by things like social media or the change to a single ballot electoral system in 2019. And this was the response that I got. The first part was actually spoken to me in English, which was a surprise. Uh, he said, the world is built on patronage. No matter what system we're in, it's still a patronage system. The same individual said to me that this style of campaigning was like building a house using bricks and mortar. It's old school, but old school is what stands the test of times. Based on these uh, two examples, I came away with the impression that vote canvassing networks still remain an influential blueprint for how to do electoral politics. Parties must secure the support of factions or candidates with the largest and most reputable networks, while the candidates must build networks consisting of local leaders who can deliver votes in blocks, at, or at least a majority of the votes in their localities. Money still typically serves as a glue that's necessary for holding the network together and mobilizing it during elections, but it's not always sufficient. What I found quite striking is that when we move closer to the bottom, what vote canvassers actually do to gain the support of voters can be quite personal rather than purely transactional, even when, when money is still often a key component. Here's a few examples that I came across, and I'm going to emphasize just the last one, which I discovered through an interview with a vote canvasser who worked for a Pithai MP. During the rice pledging scheme in 2010, only rice farmers who could prove that they own farmland were eligible to participate in the program, which was in effect uh, promised by the government to buy every grain of rice at twice the market rate. Many of the farmers in the locality did not own the land, so they organized themselves and demanded that the vote canvasser bring the issue up to the MP to get the MP to intervene on their behalf by asking local state officials to make an exception. This example illustrates that patronage politics can take place in the context of public policy, and it also underscores that this practice is sometimes initiated by voters, not by politicians. In this case, it looks more like a mode of interest representation that operates outside formal channels as a way to negotiate the conditions of their personal well-being with an otherwise impersonal or sometimes even predatory entity that is the, the state. I have a few more examples, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip them for now, but we can always come back to these after the presentation. In the examples that, uh, in my experience that I came across, uh, suggests that vote canvassers are people with local proximity, uh, embeddedness, and reputation who can make use of resources and connection to actors above their station to do favors for ordinary voters. And come election time, they're typically in an advantageous position to generate goodwill on behalf of candidates. In other words, the power differential between vote canvassers and voters may not be as stark as what we have seen in the past or what we have come to assume, 
on the basis of many existing theories. And I think this has to do in some ways with how local governance in Thailand has become more fragmented and decentralized with uh, the entry of actors like local politicians, health volunteers, and other community leaders who need to maintain their standing by acting as champions of local interests. And other scholars have also noticed these developments as well. At the national level, however, we see an opposite trend where only a small number of factions or families control most of the local organizations and associations that make up both canvassing networks in each province. And this trend has been reinforced in part by the democratic experiments carried out by the junta, which is where we'll turn to next. To provide a brief recap, the military regime that seized power from the Yingluck government in 2014 introduced a system that concentrated power in the NCPO. That power was eventually used to create an uneven electoral playing field that operated through several mechanisms. These include, for example, uh, an, ins an institutional framework that diluted the bargaining power of political parties through the MMA electoral system and gave a head start to whomever had the backing of the appointed Senate which was uh, empowered to participate in the selection of the prime minister jointly with the house. This framework was superimposed on top of an existing arrangement that endorsed appointed bodies such as the constitutional court and the election commission uh, to intervene on behalf of conservative interests, revitalizing a pattern once described as the judicialization of politics. And last but not least was the NCPO's privileged access to and control over state institutions and other resources that could be used as carrots and sticks to keep politicians and their networks in line. One example is Section 44 of the Interim Constitution, which was frequently used to suspend officials and selectively return those who agreed to support the military back to their posts. As we now know, Palang Basharat became the vessel that was selected to take advantage of these authoritarian legacies in 2019. Since Palang Basharat was established towards the end of military rule, and had never served as an authoritarian ruling party, it did not build or inherit organizational linkages to ordinary citizens. It also competed in a landscape where building support solely through policy-based or ideological appeals have never really worked out in favor of parties opposed to Thaksin. Against this backdrop, the most viable option was to co-op provincial elites, dynasties, and factions who controlled vote canvassing networks a pattern that resembles the Samakitan party in 1992. And the party's affiliation with the military regime was what gave it the means to do this on a large scale. Here's what a party insider had to say about Palang Basharat's party building strategy. Let's start with the fact that we work with the military. They had their own teams and networks consisting of military officers, police officers, and bureaucrats within the Ministry of Interior. These were the levers of state that were deployed to assist us in recruiting factions and candidates. In plain language, stage, state power always plays a role in every election in Thailand. But during this election, we were given total and exclusive access to state power, which enabled us to persuade, coerce, or offer protection to targeted individuals that had the potential. In other words, the party was playing the game of patronage politics through established pathways. For example, by recruiting subnational leaders with pre-existing networks and mobilizing these networks during elections, but it did so on a deeply uneven playing field and using resources that were not usually available to parties in a democratic regime, or at least not to the same degree. The same can be said for the party's abundant financial, financial resources, which were promised and distributed to factions and candidates based on an in informal ranking system. In practice, uh, party building was a matter of building an electoral patchwork to substitute for the party infrastructure. This wasn't uncommon for political parties in Thailand, but I would argue that the Plank Basharat took it to new heights, and this planted the seeds of intense intra-party conflict that would later result in changes in the party leadership, large-scale defection by its MPs, and Bayut's departure as candidate for prime minister. Using its affiliation with the military regime, the party was quite successful in terms of co-opting um, factions that were interested in being on the good side of the military, whether to get elected, secure financial support, or legal protection. In some provinces or regions where the party did not recruit political heavyweights, it left matters in the hands of designated regional leaders, for example, Kaptan Thamanat Prompao in the north or Colonel Sushat in the south. Beyond these factions, there were also military officers who had their own teams of candidates and this was deeply upsetting to many party members because, in the word of one faction leader, 
these weren't great A candidates that had the best chance of winning. So basically, this was a power sharing arrangement that takes place in the context of candidate selection. And it, it was deeply prone to factional struggle from the very beginning. In a province in northern Thailand, one faction was being sidelined by another faction that claimed to have stronger candidates. And that conflict was uh, resolved through a balance of power by bringing in a third faction to mediate. It was like an anarchy. Uh, similar conflicts also occurred in other provinces. And what happened in many cases was that these factions had to go above the party and use personal connections to actors affiliated with the NCPO to settle factional disputes. In other words, power was never vested in the party leader or the executive committee, but in elite settlements involving factions in the party and actors affiliated with the NCPO. Due to the single ballot electoral design, this co-optation strategy did not translate into strong support for Palang Basharat in a consistent manner. The party outperformed expectations in places where it did not rely heavily on the strength of factions, for example, in Bangkok and much of the South. And what happened after the election was the buying of MPs who had no strict factional allegiance by the factions that made up the party organization, something that we now call Toplane Bopuen or fishing in a friend's pond. And where the party performed well without Prayut's appeal, campaigning was based on a highly localized campaign strategy. To give you an example, in one case, Prayut's face never appeared on the campaign poster in the district. At the same time, the faction in that district made use of the party's ties to the NCPO to secure protection for the faction leader's sibling who was facing an allegation and to secure the loyalty of local officials who initially refused to support the faction as vote canvassers. These findings suggest that Palang Basharat was not simply a case of the military regime using patronage-oriented politicians to build support for a military-backed party. It was also very much a case of provincial elites and factions finding opportunities to safeguard their own power and networks under the guise of building support for the military-backed party and exploiting resources and protection that the regime had to offer on the basis of its grip on power. So what are some of the key takeaways? One could make the argument that even without the military regime or a military-backed party, general elections in Thailand will still remain mired in patronage politics. And I think this counterfactual is most likely true, judging by what we can see from parties that are not directly under the influence of the regime, with the notable exception of the Future Forward, Move Forward Party. However, in the presence of the current military regime, even piecemeal changes for example, in response to decentralization or social media have been curtailed or subdued. The case of Palang Basharat demonstrates that there is a remarkable affinity between patronage politics and Thai style authoritarianism. We see old networks being revamped and redeployed to provide electoral support for a military backed party in return for resources and protection from the regime. Put quite simply, patronage politics has not only survived but also thrived under an electorally vulnerable regime that has proven unable or unwilling to create its own networks and linkages to the electorate. Based on what we see so far, this arrangement comes with trade-offs in the form of factionalism that may render the party organization unreliable for safeguarding the interests of authoritarian rulers. And I think we see this to some extent with the Palang Basharat. The Ruam Thai Sangshat party appears to be cut from a similar cloth, but with a more hyper-conservative ideology but in places where it cannot compete on the basis of party appeal, I expect it to follow the same pattern. And this likelihood has increased with changes in the electoral system, which shifted the locus of competition to constituency elections. The one key difference is that Prayut is no longer the head of the NCPO, and it remains to be seen if these same authoritarian levers in 2019 can still be used to grant advantages to his party in terms of co-opting politi politicians and actors who can mobilize vote canvassing networks for the party. There's some indication that the party may try to court local politicians and vote canvassers directly, circumventing national politicians and factions to how together. So far, Prayut has promised to increase the salary of Abata nationwide. And just yesterday, uh, the cabinet approved doubling the allowance of village health volunteers who number around 1 million nationwide. But that's just incumbency advantage, not authoritarian advantage in my opinion. I think there's a good chance that these party building experiments will fail uh, for some of the reasons that I've already discussed in this presentation. And this failure could lead to even more extreme forms of authoritarian control. 
at the expense of procedural democracy and electoral institutions, however nominal these institutions may be. And that concludes my presentation and thank you very much. Well, thank you Nafon for a really interesting presentation. Um, I would like to invite our audience members to start posting their questions um, into the, well, using the Q&A function. So please use that, do not use the chat um, if you have questions. But before I start um, going through the questions, we've already have a couple in the Q&A. Um, I would like sure. to abuse my position of actually being a, a moderator for your um, presentation. And I, I do remember that, you know, in the lead up to the 2019 election, I mean, obviously there was such a big gap in, 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 in you know, from the last full election that actually was uh, went fully ahead and we had the results, um, which was back in 2011 because the 2014 election was cancelled. And yeah. I do remember that there was a bit of a discussion at some point in Thai politics that perhaps the influence or the effectiveness of the patronage policy maybe was no longer as mm -hmm. high. And then the 2019 election came and that was very much hailed as the, you know, the revival of yeah. uh, the patronage politics. And, you know, we have this kind of old po style politics back. Um, but, you know, I would really like to push you a little bit more on the on the point, you know, how effective do you really think that this um, the patronage politics is really and, and um, you know, do you think that this is actually a sustainable mode of mm. doing politics in Thailand going forward, because especially I think there were high hopes with those several factions in the northeast that they would be able to, you know, co-opt a lot of votes for Parang Pracharat Party in the 2019 election. And the performance in the northeast was not that yeah. um, successful, despite, you know, several um, really prominent figures actually switching from Puthai to Palang Pracharat party yep. and becoming, you know, the leading, I mean, you had the three three groups there with the leading politicians. So, you know, what do you think about this? Do you think that the effectiveness is really still there? And and do you foresee this defining Thai politics maybe in the next 10 years still? Are we still going to sit here and talk about patronage politics in Thailand? Yeah, sure. Um, in, in terms of the effectiveness question, I think that depends heavily, uh, is strongly influenced by the nature of electoral rules as well. Um, I think I mentioned in my presentation that it's the strategy hasn't really translated into uh, electoral performance in a consistent manner. And by that, I mean, in some regions, uh, since it was a single ballot, uh, some voters were perceiving uh, their vote as a vote for the party as opposed to a vote for a candidate. Um, and that has subdued some um, influence of, of these networks to some extent, in some, especially in, uh, based on my, my conversation with a politician who worked with, who previously worked with Puerto uh, they claimed that in areas that had farmland, uh, for example, they could observe significant decline in terms of uh, the vote share for the faction. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in effectiveness, I think that depends to some extent on the electoral system as well. Um, and second part is that we, I think the locus of where patronage politics is constructed, uh, how it operates, I think the, uh, it has shifted to some extent to uh, local politics. Um, and that's where you really see uh, a lot of uh, these practices as uh, vote buying, uh, things like you know local development. I think you see that more clearly in the local arena than the national ones. For mm -hmm. the national politics one, it's more mostly about securing uh, the support of these local leaders. And in, in my opinion, that's that's where the, the, the difference is. And I'm not saying that uh, it would always be effective, but I think that the absence of local party infrastructures had to be, you know, it had to be filled somehow, right? That vacuum. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the only ways for parties in Thailand. Yeah, and I think you mentioned obviously part of the 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 reason that, especially in the the run up to the twenty nineteen election, we had a lot of new parties actually popping up out of nowhere. So as yeah. you said, the infrastructure wasn't there. But I think this is the interesting point because so typically with the military um, aligned parties, at least in 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 the history of Thai politics, we didn't really have a party that would really be able to kind of establish itself fully and last for a for a persistent. Yeah. Um, amount of time. I mean, Palang Prasharad is kind of now surviving for quite a long time, but that's been with a lot of complications, as you said, with obviously right. the national infighting and, and everything. Yeah, the, the survival of Palang Prasharad has always uh, amazed me. Um, and yeah. I, 
maybe the credit should be given not to the party, uh, but to mm -hmm. the, the structure in which the party is embedded. Mm -hmm. So Would in that like sense, I think it distinguished uh, Palamacharat from Samaki Tam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so we've got four questions in the chat now. So let me ask okay. um, some of those. So we've got a question from Julian Spindler asking, as the Move Forward Party is the only party with a firm ideology and an election platform that addresses Thailand's main structural challenges, what chance does the Move Forward Party have of breaking through the patronage politics? I guess maybe that's also... Um, geared towards you know the upcoming election yeah. and as you mentioned you know the, the rule of the games are important they have changed so now we've got two ballot papers not one so um mm -hmm. you know what do you think i think this is a really interesting question i was actually um it's not really the move forward party that i see breaking through patronage politics it's actually the the progressive movement that i see uh, as standing a chance um i was in uh one of the it's the launch of the progressive movement in that room. They uh, announced the candidates for uh, Nayok mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting experience because basically Tanathan gave a speech essentially declaring war on vote buying and, and patronage politics uh, pretty in a direct manner. Um, I think since we are starting from the premise that patronage politics at the national level is mostly about competing for the support of local leaders. I think it has to be resolved at the local level first um, before you know, moving to national ones. So the question whether the move forward party stands a chance or not, I do not think it stands a chance in this current landscape. Um, it mm -hmm. will have, uh, it may be able to uh, initiate pockets of transformation, uh, but that would not translate into uh, strong electoral support in the absence of this structure. And that's my my opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. yep. um, we've got um, another question from uh, Saksitse Sombat. Um, he's asking um, that you have described the style of politics um, has gone in uh, into overdrive at the last election in 2019, uh, thanks to the involvement of the NCPO and other military forces. But now we see the likes of Prawit and Prayut becoming politicians in, in the more traditional classical sense, attempting to do the sort, uh, the sort of patronage politics the old school way. Are we seeing a return to the old style and how successful do you think PPRP and UTN will be? Okay. Um, <clears throat> in my presentation, I mentioned that one of the most important source uh, of control over the leaders of patronage networks that are, you know, separated as uh, they're spread out nationwide, is the control of uh, the state apparatus, and I think that uh, firm control has not been as significant um, in recent years, and I always liken it to authoritarian authoritarian levers, and and right now there there seems to be two leaders pulling on these levers. So maybe that's as good as dysfunctional, in my opinion. And so I do not think that they will be extremely successful with this um, style of politics, not as successful as uh, the Palamacharat right in 2019, for sure. Mm -hmm. And maybe perhaps to address a bit of an elephant in the room, obviously, in the lead up to this um, election, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the relationship between Prayot and Prawit. Um, you know, do you really believe that there's been a, a real fallout? And if so, how do you think it will affect the electoral chances of these still kind of pro-military parties, conservative parties in the Thai, Thai politics? I'm sorry, can you, could you rephrase the question? Yeah, so, um, you know, with the, in the lead up to this election, there's yeah. been, um, uh, you know, Prayut leaving the Panam Prachara party, joining the UTN. Um, you know, do you think that, you leaving Palang Pracharat signifies some kind of fallout in the relationship between Prayut and Prawit, and that this fallout will have a real consequence for the electoral for fortunes or that, or that it will affect um, the electoral fortunes of both Palang Pracharat and perhaps the UTN. So how do you see that? Or do you think it's just a tactic? Um, oh, okay. You know? um, I, based on what I know and what I understand, uh, I do not think it's a tactic. I think there is a real fallout. And, mm -hmm. and that's based on interviews that I've conducted 
uh, right after the election, there was a sense among uh, the faction leaders within Palang Basharat that uh, they were not getting what they signed up for, as in, mm. you know, hey, we, we were the ones that went out and campaigned for the party, but we didn't get the cabinet portfolio that we expected. And they were trying to push for the party leader to, to bargain with uh, the prime minister, but it didn't really pan out. And so they instigated an internal coup, so to speak, um, got Prawit into the position. And Prawit at that time was for, sort of alienated, alienated by uh, the alienated by Prayut a little bit because he did not con he no longer controlled the police and the military. Um, mm. Yeah, so I do think that there was a real fallout, and that could signify uh, a loss in political control mm -hmm. in the upcoming elections. Yes. Do you believe that to be true for Palang Pracharat Party, but potentially, or I mean, UT and obviously it's, it's a newly okay. created party. Um, for Palang Pracharat, I think that it doesn't have as strong um, control over mm -hmm. factions as we imagine it does. Okay. I I do. I think that most of the faction leaders that are still with Palang Basharat is using Rawit, not the other way <laughs> around. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, that's a very interesting way of, um, of of viewing it. So that's that's a really great insight. We've got a question from Duncan Macargo. You okay. have used the military regime a few times. Do you consider the present Thai government to be such a regime? Wow, difficult question as always. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> My gut instinct says no. Okay. Um, I do think that uh, the military regime uh, has more appendages that mm -hmm. are not present in the Thai government currently. And by that, I mean link linkages to the military and the royal institution. And, and mm -hmm. I do not think that the current Thai government has those appendages currently. Mm -hmm. Right, so so it's not the same mm. that what we saw not back. The same. Yep. In not the 20... same as in two thousand nineteen. Yes. Right. Great. Um, so we've got another question um, from Elijah Levian, and and he's asking, "What sums of money are we speaking about in terms of buying an individual vote or getting certain local level officials on board?" And okay. in terms of, let's say, national party, um, where is the money coming from? Is it coming from corporations, rich families, or somewhere else? I think you had a bit of a graph on you to, to, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You... Um, there is actually quite striking diversity <laughs> um, uh, based on my field work. Um, in terms of buying individual vote uh, the, in 2019, I came, striking variation, I saw 300 up to 1,000. Um, and for individual MPs, I saw up to 10 million to 35 or 40 million. Yeah. But um, in terms of where the money comes from, I do not have knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. I guess it's also difficult to, to get to the bottom of it because these transactions are not very transparent, are they? Yeah, not at all. So in, in my field work, <laughs> I, only saw, I only saw money twice on the first day and the last day of the field work. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, it's not very transparent. Yep. It was quite quite interesting how it sort of uh, framed your field work, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought I would see more, but no, I didn't. <laughs> um, we've got another question for Fadzila my, um Kug. Despite the patronage at increasingly higher levels, civil society politics is equally strong and social movements can be unpredictable. If patronage politics is an aspect of feudalism, yet there are channels for politics, how can we still use feudal framework? Um, for example, modify feudal. feudal okay. I, I think past. I think I sort of understand where where the question is getting at. I do not okay. think that patronage politics, in its current state in Thailand, fits into the framework of feudalism. Yeah. I think there's just not enough um, asymmetric power relationships between vote canvassers and voters for us to describe it as, as feudalism. Um, yeah. Like I said, in some examples, it looks like a mode of interest representation, an imperfect one, but it's a, it's still a way of holding some people accountable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've got another question from um, 
one of the audience members asking that in the Philippines, patronage politics is very much apparent, but political turncoatism or existence of politicians moving from one party to another, so switching parties is common. Does political turncoatism or switching of political parties exist within patronage politics in Thailand? And yes, if yes, to what extent? I think some of that was already covered, but if you could maybe elaborate. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, yes, it, it happens quite frequently. And we usually see it with parties that don't, don't have a strong um, set of ideology. Um, and of course, there's significant variation in terms of whether a politician gets punished in terms of voter backlash or not. Uh, depending on which party you move from and which party you move to. Uh, for, so, uh, you know, the, the, the example that's always used is the, the Nguyen group moving, switching out of uh, Palang Machachon and just getting destroyed afterwards. Yep. Um, we just had one more question that's um, slightly similar to, to some of the questions that we've already had, but I think it's asking quite an interesting question. Um, since Tax and Tarak Thai Party appeared to break local patronage politics in the 2005 election, when no matter who you were, you needed to run under the Tarak Thai banner to win, how long will it take for you know, the likes of the progressive movement and the Move Forward Party to, to do the same or to help break this okay. kind of cycle? Um, I do not think that the Tarak Thai broke local patronage politics. I do understand that uh, they reformed the system in part. Uh, for example, in the back in the olden days, you would distribute financial support through faction leaders that you know are provincial politicians. And but back in the Thai Thai, it was distributed through you know leaders who were directly reporting to the party leader. So, so mm -hmm. there was sort of a reform of the system. It was managerial in 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 some sense. And there were talks about you know, politicians being converted into a salary man and they were using the Tyrek Thai uh, canteen and fitness rooms. So um, I think they transformed the system and they did not um, do away with patronage politics. Um, as for whether the move forward and future forward will attempt something like this. So I think they, are, they have taken a much more um, clear stance on this, uh, mm -hmm. as, as, especially Piyabut. Um, I think he has mentioned times and again that he's not going to, and I'm sorry, I'm conflating move forward with future forward, but I still see them as the same general yeah. <laughs> party institution. Um, but yes, I think they have denied uh, the use of patronage politics as a way to secure political support. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe moving away a little bit from um, Palang Pracharat, because we've talked about it quite a lot, um, we've got a question from Mei Wong asking, how do you see Pertai and Pumtai Thai using patronage politics to play to their advantage? And what's your assessment of their likely performance in the upcoming elections? Obviously, okay. I know that this is a lot of speculation in terms right, of... Right, right, uh, right. I think I have to speculate quite a lot because... Um, so Pumtai Thai, I only interviewed one person from Pumtai Thai, and I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't you know, claim to have an insider knowledge on what's going on. But I I do see that uh, Pum Jai Thai has invested quite a bit in terms of um, securing the support of MPs uh, from other parties. I remember like a few months ago, they were, you know, holding, what, what was it, a birthday party uh, for mm -hmm. Nguyen. And 33 uh, MPs from several parties joined the party as in like attended the party, not joined yeah. the party. And they, yes. some of some of them <laughs> later joined, actually joined the Pum Jai Thai. So, um, but if you go and look at the pattern um, in which they recruited uh, politicians, they didn't come um, as a as a whole faction. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that used to be the case in, in the Thai Ak Thai or even Palang Bacharat, whole factions would come on board, but the Pum Jai Thai selectively picked um, people uh, from, from different factions or some people who in Bangkok that did not belong to uh, any factions at all. Um, I do not think that that strategy uh, would pan out um, in terms of um, securing, uh, in terms of uh, generating political support. But I do know that Pum Jai Thai has a very strong um, set of candidates who are already equipped to do that without, you know, having to buy MPs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So we've got two follow-up questions, um, yeah. one from Duncan, which is a bit shorter, so I'll start with that one. So there is much speculation concerning a possible deal between Prawit and Taksin or the uh, Puthai Party and Palang Pracharat Party. 
do you believe this is really the case? Hmm. This is uh, also a difficult question, and I always go back and forth on this. I do see that every attempt by Palangbacharat has been to open, to keep it open, to keep the opportunity mm -hmm. open, to keep things open for a possibility of uh, a deal. Um, mm -hmm. And in part, I think much of the um, the dialogue has taken place through Kapan uh, Tamanat from Pau rather than between yeah. Prawit and, and Taksin directly. So I, I do not know if there's a, such a deal. I mean, that would have significant consequences for um, the upcoming election yes. or the post-election, yep. whatever that would. Yeah, uh, I do not know if, if there's such a deal, but I do know that it would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on that a bit more? Can I push you a little bit more on that yeah, point? Yeah, of course. Um, it makes sense for Prawit, uh, who seems to want to remain in uh, in power uh, somehow. And it makes sense for Thai, who seems like they want to form a government and, how do you say, reconsolidate its power. It's been many years since uh, its electoral base has received any concrete policies by the party. And if we ignore some of the policy scandals that occurred in you know, 2010, 2011, yeah. then the really the concrete achievements were during the Thai Rakhtai years. Yeah. Yeah. So we also have a follow up question by Saxit Sayasumbad, and I think that's probably the last one we will manage to do. Okay. Um, but um, he's asking how will Prayut and Prawit then try to tap into state resources and the NCPO network leftovers, as you have illustrated in 2019 when they are up against each other? Or is that just another battlefield about how can rally uh, more groups behind them? Okay, um, two parts to this. One part is just the fact that the current prime minister is Prayut um, and that Anupong Pajinda controls the Ministry of Interior. Uh, I think that that's how they tap into state resources, that's frankly mm -hmm. speaking. Um, and that has really nothing to do with the fact that these uh, generals were associated with the NCPO. Mm -hmm. um, but the NCPO network leftovers, that I think that's a, I don't, I'm not sure like what, what that means. Do you mean uh, appointed bodies uh, or, you know, people who were appointed to the constitutional court? Uh, do you mean ISOC networks? I think these uh, are not very transparent as in who controls the, them. But I do know for a fact that uh, the Senate sort of split in terms of um, who controls the appointed senators. But Witt mm -hmm. was the chair of the selection committee, but um, many of the people who appeared on the list were, you know, associated with Prayut. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's it's very um, difficult to yeah. to really fully see who controls whom yeah. and what kind of institution in, in that sense. Great. Well, thank you very much for, um, for an absolutely brilliant talk and for um, some very valuable insights. I know that we've uh, sort of tortured you a little bit too more about the upcoming elections and um, with with certain speculations, but I think that's been it's been it's been a great talk and um, you've handled the questions really well. So thank you very much for your time and for joining us um, today um, and for your time. Thank you so much, Petra, and thank you uh, the audience for tuning in. Thank you very much. And we we shall see you um, again in May. So keep an eye out for the next um, TS4, TS4 webinar session. So we, we have a break in April, but there's going to be another session in May. So thank you very much for joining us today.